Hello, I'm Robert Klitzman. I'm the director of the Masters of Bioethics program at Columbia University, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to a uh, webinar, which should be fascinating, on race in bioethics, amplifying diverse voices. Issues of race are, of course, central to much of healthcare, but often don't get the attention that they should, or get attention, but perhaps not in the right ways or the ways that some of us might think is best. We have a fascinating uh, panel for you this evening with some wonderful panelists. Uh, I'm gonna introduce them and then have each of them speak for several minutes, and then we will have a question and answer period. But uh, we see this as really a very interactive session. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat at any point, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first speaker is gonna be Dr. Keisha Ray. Uh, Dr. Ray earned a PhD in philosophy from the University of Utah and is currently an assistant professor at the University of Texas uh, uh, Health Center, uh, the McGovern Center uh, for Humanities and Ethics at the uh, McGovern Medical School. Uh, she was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of South Carolina. And much of her work focuses on social determinants of racial disparities in health and healthcare and ways of addressing race education in medical school curriculum. She's also a senior editor at the American Journal of Bioethics. We're also delighted to have with us Dr. Louis Voigt. He is the chair of the Ethics Committee at Memorial Sloan Ketter Kettering Cancer Center. He is a critical care physician with expertise in critical care medicine. He received his medical degree from the University of Haiti School of Mexico of uh, School of Medicine. Uh, he is also uh, the founder and currently the director of the Empire State Bioethics Consortium, uh, which has brought together bioethicists from all over New York State and elsewhere to discuss critical issues in the field. Our third speaker is Joanne Suarez. She is the founding director of Latinx Bioethics, a new organization with a mission of cultivating partnerships across institutions to address ethical and moral issues that affect Latinx communities. And she'll be talking about that work. She has a master's of bioethics from the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And last, but by no means least, we have Harriet Washington, who is a lecturer in our master's of bioethics program here at Columbia but she's also the author of several important books, uh, one of which, Medical Apartheid, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction and was a New York Times bestseller. She's written several other books as well, including A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind, and uh, Deadly Monopolies, The Shocking Corporate Takeover of Life Itself and the Consequences for Your Health and Our Medical Future. So without further ado, uh, we're delighted to have uh, the four speakers uh, talk. I asked each of them to speak for a few minutes each about what they see as some of the major issues uh, in the area of race and bioethics today, what some of the gaps and challenges are, and how we can best address them. So Dr. Ray, welcome. Thank you, appreciate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. So. My co-panelists and I have been tasked with thinking about the ways that bioethics does, or in most cases, does not consider issues of race, including racism and systemic health inequities. Although I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak about bioethics because it is something very dear to me, could not see myself doing anything else, this opportunity also feels like another moment, particularly in my career, where a bioethicist of color has to defend her work and her place in bioethics and hope others in the field see the value of her work and the value of black bioethicists. So we know that most bioethicists are white and arguably because of this, much of the academic work we produce centers whiteness, white privilege, and a misunderstanding of the far reaching effects of racism on health. But now that bioethicists of color are starting to challenge the ways we research, write about, and teach bioethics, now bioethicists are putting the burden on bioethicists of color to prove that what we do is bioethics, essentially prove that we belong. But as I discuss gaps in how bioethics addresses race or the perspective that black bioethicists and other bioethicists of color can bring to the field, uh, I wanna challenge you all to keep in mind the value of our work 
does not depend on how well our work is received by white bioethicists. The value of our work does not depend on how well we fit the guidelines of what is considered bioethics. Many black bioethicists like myself are sort of bugging the traditions of bioethics that don't serve uh, us or the populations of color that we study. Instead, we are creating lanes in bioethics that allow us to do the work that we set out to do to study and serve marginalized populations, to bring our perspectives to all of the typical topics studied in bioethics and challenge the typical ethical and legal frameworks we have so often lazily come to rely on. Bioethics can only hope to remain a relevant field of study if it opens the door to these new lanes, these new ways of doing bioethics, and thus embrace the diversity and thought bioethicists of color bring to the proverbial table. So first, um, bioethicists, as we all know, um, like their principles, right? We are a principled bunch. Most of our theoretical and practical frameworks to some degree rely on principles, and we like to talk a lot about things like justice. I think most bioethicists believe justice in healthcare and justice in terms of health equity are important. Where we differ is what justice means, how it can be achieved, and for whom justice ought to be prioritized. This is one area where diverse voices can add to the field and keep it constantly evolving. We already talk about how justice may mean different things for different people, but what we have given a little bit less attention to is what racial justice may mean in the different topics that we study. So for instance, I've done a little bit of work on racial justice and cognitive enhancement, you know, using stimulants to enhance mental capacities. But often the research in this field is whitewashed in that it begins from an ideal place, an ideal theoretical place, with this ideal world where it leaves out things like racism, inequality, white supremacy, right? These things don't exist in the frameworks that they start out with. So for example, using cognitive enhancement or stimulants for people to get a leg up in the competition for jobs. Research in this area ignores that there's racism in hiring. Um, Latinx people, black people are very aware of how they have sort of um, a setback just by their very nature being Latinx and black when they're going up for jobs against white people. So when we have this research in cognitive enhancement and competition for jobs, Ignoring this is another way of ignoring the real life experience of people of color and how people of color may not support using cognitive enhancement competition for jobs because it's another disadvantage on top of the ones that they already have like systemic racism and interpersonal racism. And the point that I tried to make with my work in this area is to think about how racism touches all parts of people of color lives and that it can't be ignored in research, especially research that intends to reflect the real world and people's lived experiences. Without diverse people involved in all parts of research, including publishing, peer reviewing, editing, and presenting at lectures and conferences and webinars like this, this kind of research that ignores diverse experiences, um, it gets ignored and left out of the profession, right? These experiences, these perspectives get left out. And in a time when the public is demanding that science and literature and all these other disciplines, that they produce information that takes into account their experiences, bioethics cannot afford to leave out diverse voices. So this also highlights another issue for bioethicists who study race. Um, and that is that often our work is often seen as siloed or that our work on race should always be its own separate bioethical topic. But all topics in bioethics study some, at least to some degree, the ethical, the legal, and the social realm of our lives, the lived experience, the health sciences, in other words, the real world, and therefore intersect with race, racism, and racial justice. There is no topic in bioethics that can ignore race and racism. From how we are born to how we die, everything in between is a matter of race. Psychedelics, environmental justice, euthanasia, uh, resource allocation, clinical trials, pediatric care, all of it all intersects with race and racism because our institutions are racist. The people involved in institutions and practices we study are racist, and there are people whose lives are constantly affected by conscious and subconscious racism. So segregating race studies from all the other topics in bioethics is misguided is misguided and truly shows an ignorance for how a lot of people of color live their lives. So for diverse voices though, to enrich bioethics, we have to make it possible for people of color, um, for scholars of color, excuse me, to participate in bioethics. We have to support and fund diverse graduate students. 
they have to hire diverse by what this is and remove those roadblocks that prevent their hiring. And one roadblock um, that I have encountered frequently is the what you do is not bioethics roadblock. That's how I like to think about it. So I've encountered this many times in the job market where I've had to defend my work beyond the normal academic criticism that we all are accustomed to, but defend the necessity of my work, right? Defend um, that my work belongs in bioethics, that I'm truly doing bioethics work, and that it's not better suited in a discipline like public health or sociology or some other kind, um, and that I have something to say that is worthwhile and beneficial to the profession. So calling work, though, at the intersection of race and health not bioethics is a not so subtle method of keeping bioethics of color out of bioethics. If people can degrade our work and question its relevance, then they can push us out and maintain bioethics racial homogeneity. Secondly, along the supporting and funding graduate students and viewing our work in race as work that it makes us hireable, we also have to call upon journal editors to reshape acceptable practices and publishing in peer review. So during this time, I call it the, the time of bioethics racial awakening, uh, particularly encouraged by COVID and all of the racial inequities that, that it exposed to many people who were not aware of them uh, prior to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I've been reviewing many articles on race and racism and health. I've searched for peer reviewers for a lot lately. Uh, and I'm happy that these articles have made it to the point in the process where the articles have reached peer reviews, because that in itself um, is a, is a, is really big, but a lot of the articles that make it to this place that are talking about race and health um, are not doing a very good job um, because one, they don't engage any scholars of color who have already written on these topics and they exist. Um, I know some time ago there was this thread on Twitter about where are all of the, the by what this is of color writing on race. And that just means you're being lazy and that you haven't looked because they're there. The people in this panel have written on it, but there are tons of other people you just have to look. And two, um, they don't call it racism and they don't call it out in the systemic and interpersonal forms. Instead, they focus solely on race. Um, I critique these articles and call out the authors for these problems. But then a few months later, I see their article published in their journal when they should have probably never been published. Editors of our bioethics journals and our medical journals um, have a lot of power in our profession. In a profession where we all have to publish to sustain our careers, editors are very important in even shaping careers, but also shaping the field. They have the power to facilitate making race more mainstream um, in bioethics and including more diverse voices in bioethics. They can demand that articles engage properly with the literature on race and racism, and that peer reviewers check for these things while reviewing. This would be an institutional endeavor to address diversity in bioethics that also does not put the burden on um, bioethics of color. So diverse voices in bioethics are absolutely necessary for the relevance and longevity of bioethics. But we have to go beyond tokenism, beyond lip service, and make changes to the ways we practice bioethics and make it an environment that diverse bioethicists want to be a part of. If we don't, then bioethics will not survive the changing world. So to end, um, just want to recall that what I said at the opening, bioethics of color are not here to save bioethics. We are here to do the work that we are passionate about. And if bioethicists don't see the value in that, then we'll keep doing what I've seen lately. And that is uh, scholars of color creating separate journals, um, bioethicists of color giving other bioethicists of color job opportunities, conference opportunities, lecture opportunities. Um, scholars of color hosting webinars and lectures on race and racism that are led by bioethics of color, or even choosing to leave bioethics for other more welcoming fields and creating separate bioethics frameworks and practices such as black bioethics, which I myself have written on and have supported. But it doesn't have to be this way. Bioethics can be more unified, but that requires leaders in the field, center directors, department chairs, grant giving institutions to change the way that we think about bioethics and bioethicists of color. Um, but again, bioethicists of color are not going to wait for bioethics, bioethics to get its act together. POC bioethicists who work on race are not here to prove themselves. Instead, I think it is bioethics who should prove that is a place where we can thrive, support our work, and we will support bioethics. Thank you. That was great, thank you. Dr. Voigt. I think you're on mute. 
Thanks, Dr. Klitzman. I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, and I truly appreciate uh, Dr. Gray's uh, comments uh, and passionate plea for changes in the field of bioethics. Uh, I am going to take a slightly different uh, um, or more nuanced viewpoint. Uh, we are living in America. And America was built on removing Indians who were the natives of this uh, country from their natural habitats and moving them to what they considered to be a reservation. It, is, it was also built on having uh, a bunch of African-Americans being shipped from the western coast of the African continent to the United States uh, as free labor. That's the historical legacy that if we're going to talk about health, healthcare, and bioethics, we cannot ignore. I don't view it solely as a story between black and white, because in reality, race has also been used as a weapon against other ethnic minorities. Having said that, we all need to acknowledge and understand that race is a social construct. And as such, it influenced the way we see each other, but also it influenced the way we as scientists and physicians look at others and the world in defining our approaches, approaches to disease prevention, to management and to restoring health. And this makes it quite simplistic as a construct. And that's the reason it has been ingrained in medical sciences, because it helps people focus on differences and try to establish cause and effect relationship when it's come to understanding health and illness. However, the reality is that race is a substitute for a variety of socioeconomic factors and that where the focus should be, particularly in the field of bioethics when we are making moral considerations for our society. These factors create disparities, not only in access to healthcare, but also in the way that physicians and others approach illnesses, approach individuals with illnesses, and then, and then treat these individuals. So I am not advocating for ignoring race, but we also should not ignore the fact that race is a substitute for inequities and for disparities. And if we're going to address it only through the prism of race, as in the bioethics community, I think this is uh, a mistake. In reality, if you look at medicine, there are extremely rare illnesses or condition where race is a determining factor. Yet, physicians, scientists, nurses, government, public health experts, public health advocates, healthcare organization, use race in a variety of instances that are imbued in bias and discrimination. By looking at race, they try to justify expected outcomes. If these individuals were affluent, were educated, 
this the racial factor in the way that they access health services and also in their outcome could be different. It is not always the case. And that's the reason we shouldn't also ignore racism that is present in the way that we care for patients in America. The historical legacy of slavery is there. Racism is real. And bias against certain race and ethnic group is real. The impact of Tuskegee, the impact of other Indian groups in Arizona who were part of an ethical experiment, the impact of Henrietta Lacks is forever present in the psyche of African Americans and people of color in the United States. And as Dr. Gray alluded to, COVID-19 has made these racial differences in health outcome more apparent. And we, as a community of bioethicists, should look at this problem and consider a few strategies. One is to acknowledge and understand that racism create vulnerability in the way that we as scientists and physicians care for patients, enroll them in research, ca deliver care to them and help them prevent uh, illnesses, but also the way that we tend to blame patients of color when they don't show to their appointment, ignoring the fact that many of them struggle to buy medication because of lack of insurance or under insurance. We should also resist the temptation of always integrating race in a variety of factors that we use as tool in making medical decisions. For example, to decide whether somebody has kidney failure or something called acute kidney injury, to decide whether somebody should be restratified for cardiac surgery because they have a heart attack. All of that is all of these factors that we use in medicine and in nursing care and in a variety of healthcare agencies, these factors are not rooted in empirical evidence. It is the construct of a group of people who decided that African Americans, they are more muscular. Therefore, they would be more inclined to produce creatinine, which is a byproduct of a muscle. And based on that, we will determine and include race as, as a discriminating factor in deciding which glomerular filtration rate, which aspect of their kidney function would be considered to be normal and abnormal. And these problems permeate through the way we practice medicine in America. And I am inviting, and I am grateful for the opportunity here to invite the bioethics community to look at race but not just to look at it, uh, to look at race in analyzing every single uh, uh, aspect of healthcare, but not just to limit it to race, but to also expand it because behind the veil of race, you have a variety of other structural inequities that exist. And until we address them, we can lament about race and racism. We are not going to achieve true inequity in healthcare access and healthcare outcome in America. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I want to welcome uh, Joanne Suarez. Welcome and thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, my colleagues, for your remarks. Um, I will be talking about what activism can do for bioethics um, in light of our work with Latinx bioethics. Um, we frame our work to be led by the principle of justice and then autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence follow. Um, next, please. So I'll start by grounding us in our diversity statement. We are aware that by centering the moral and ethical issues impacting Latinx communities, we may be marginalizing the values and identities of our neighboring communities. Latinx bioethics is not exclusive to Latinx voices, and we strive for inclusion, welcoming all identities, appreciating diverse perspectives, and being respectful of the individual's values and convictions. Our intention is to amplify marginalized issues to further bioethical discourse, not to dominate it. Next, please. So the field of bioethics, as um, Dr. Ray said, has been predominantly dominated by white voices, and it has failed to address issues of race, ethnicity, and culture within its scope. Um, with address with a special attention to these ethnocultural perspectives and race, our mission is to cultivate partnerships across institutions to address the ethical and moral issues impacting Latinx communities. And we seek to do this by increasing the, the visibility of Latinx scholars in the field, engaging the voices of scholars, artists, and activists working to amplify the concerns impacting our communities and by bringing awareness to the ethical issues um, that impact our people. Next, please. So this is our team. Um, that's myself, Ines, Natalia, Stacy, and Reed, our social impact associate. Next. So I'll fill you guys in a little bit on how we got here. Um, I started with a very very radical idea while I was um, doing my master's uh, at um, Harvard Medical School. And I saw that there was nobody around me that looked like me, that I was the only Afro-Latina in my class. But what bothered me was that I was not reading black and brown scholars. Um, the majority of the text was by white philosophers and white ideas. And I knew that there were people out there that A, looked like me and that were black and Latino and indigenous that were writing about bioethical issues that they were really engaging um, these lenses that we were discussing in class. So I said to myself, I'm gonna go find, find these voices, um, particularly the Latino voices because I work um, in a predominantly Latino community and it was important for me to have the Latino voice represented in such a prominent field. Um, next. So what I did was I, I did a little bit of background research and then I organized and mobilized some of my peers um, that also identified as Latinx. And I said, you know, this is my idea. I think that we should create something that creates a mark for Latinos in bioethics and not only for Latinos, but minorities in general, because it seems like there is not a space for that right now. So we started by establishing ourselves as an affinity group um, with the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Um, next, please. And we thought that this was the best first step um, to enter the conversation, to get a seat at the table. Um, at ASBH, we have done panels, um, presentations, and have our annual affinity group meetings where we discuss contemporary and important ethical and moral issues that pertain to the Latino community. So as you can see, our first panel was focused on the ethnocultural um, considerations of use of DBS in Mexico. Our second um, panel was a discussion of our blogs uh, talking about reproductive um, health and what meanings of health look like for the Latino community. And we also did um, a debut panel on the Latinx bioethics framework and what that looks like in medical education and what that um, should look like for bioethics. 
following the establishment of our affinity group, we created our website where we currently house the LXB Forum. And it's a blog where artists and activists and scholars share their thoughts and conduct ethical analysis on these contemporary issues that we discuss in ASBH, but we also care about um, that are really hurting our people. So we have done a range of topics from reproductive rights to solidarity building to um, violations, um, research violations on Latinos and COVID-19 and more. Next, please. So in addition to establishing our um, LXB forum, we have established a URM and bioethics scholarship fund with a purpose to support minority scholars entering the field. I know that when I was studying, um, there was little to no um, support available to me. Um, and this was something that collectively we thought would be really supported for minority scholars wanting to enter the field because some students want to go to ASBH and don't have the means to um, attend these conferences. Some students have expenses like they need to buy books or they need to buy laptops or even pay for their rent um, or buy food to eat. And we wanted to make sure that we were providing um, some type of funding that reaches the needs of um, students like us. Um, our goal with the URM scholarship fund is to reach a point where we can provide tier scholarships, um, $5,000, $2,000, $1,000 scholarships to really support minorities in bioethics. Um, next. And with the support of our team, uh, we have created a Latinx bioethics directory. You could go to the next one and where we regularly update it. And in this directory, there are um, individuals that identify as bioethicists, but we also have expanded to include individuals that we recognize and we know are doing the work of bioethics. And that includes public health scholars, lawyers that aren't necessarily bioethicists, but they consider themselves to be doing this work we didn't want to narrow it down. We want to expand the moral imagination of bioethics because um, we know that it requires that in order to be a transformative field. And in order to be an inclusionary field, we have to acknowledge the people that are on the sidelines helping us um, think through these ethical issues and think through these complex systems as we go into addressing issues of race in our communities. Next, please. Now, my favorite part uh, has been the LXB Advocacy Center, and it came to be over the pandemic. Um, the work that established and grounded the Advocacy Center was the crisis standards of care in Massachusetts. LXB was at the front lines of organizing and mobilizing for the revision of the crisis standards of care um, that initially proved to be quite inequitable for black and brown communities who would have been disproportionately impacted um, if, the, if the policy would have been rolled out as such. So in a matter of two weeks, we pulled together over 400 physicians and ethicists and public health professionals to really knock on the state's door and say, hey, you know, this could potentially be killing people and making matters worse. So we need to do something and revise it to make it more equitable. Um, in addition to that work, other things that we've done through the Advocacy Center is raise funds for Colombia, which has been um, in its own uh, human rights crisis throughout the pandemic. We partnered with the Freedom Clinic in California and with Fundacion Bochinche in Cali, um, Colombia, to raise funds to make money directly accessible to frontline protesters and activists so that they can purchase their essential items, first aid kits, water, protective gear, so that they can protest peacefully. Um, some of the other work that has come out of the Advocacy Center is writing position letters. We wrote one to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights um, in El Salvador regarding a case of a woman who was wrongfully imprisoned um, for having a miscarriage and her basic human rights were violated. Um, that came across our desk and we felt compelled to 
to write a position letter saying that we stand by um, protecting her human rights and the dignity of her life. All of this work that we have done, I'm next. And in, in our most recent rollout has been our social impact internship. Bioethics is devoid of mentorship, let alone um, Black and Latino scholars that can mentor students and that can provide um, gates to the next step. So when creating our social impact internship, our goal is not to only mentor these students, but our goal is to introduce them to bioethics, to introduce them to people in the field, to get them to work hands on on real projects that involve deep ethical analysis or are tangentially related to bioethics so that they can get a scope of what it is to do this work. And if this is something that they want to devote their life to, uh, it has been very rewarding to have uh, these students under our auspices, they are learning so much and they are doing uh, a range of things that we all had to do at some point, which is which is really rewarding for them to see how you come to be into this um, space, especially as minority students entering the field. So one of the things that we have um, really grounded ourselves in is what activism can do for bioethics. Um, in order to make bioethics more inclusive and more welcoming, I mean, I certainly did not feel welcome when I was sitting in classes and my peers were predominantly white and my professors were predominantly white and um, the ideologies and the frameworks that I was learning were coming from a white-centric um, space. Next, please. Um, so in order for us to think about moving towards a more inclusive bioethics, we thought that we were not gonna wait for somebody to give us a seat at the table. We were gonna pull up our folding chair and we were gonna say, okay, this is the way that we want bioethics to be as um, rising scholars. So we're gonna do something about it. And this is how our work has come to fruition. We, we seek to keep growing, um, not only because it's what we want for the field, but we know that without us, we would be doing a disservice to our community. And the majority of Black bioethicists and Latino bioethicists that I know all have a story that brings them to this space. And it's really grounded in transforming and doing something meaningful that pours back into the community. Um, so next. So I will leave you guys with this quote by my one of my favorites, John Lewis. If you see something that is not right, that is not fair or not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And with us creating um, this organization, we hope to continue doing something not only for race and bioethics, but what bioethics can do for us as Black scholars in the field. Thank you. Hey, Bon, it's uh, great to have you joining us and your work's doing, your group's doing great work. Uh, next, but not least, is uh, Harriet Washington. Harriet, welcome. Thank you, Bob. Very happy to be here with you. And I'm deeply grateful for the illuminating remarks from my fellow panelists. I've learned a great deal already. I want to share a variety of concerns that I have about bioethics and how it can be innumerably improved by the inclusion of not just um, persons of color, although that's critically important, but also a greater attention to um, the history and the uh, ethical frameworks and frankly, the stories um, affecting people of color, not only in this country, but throughout the world. Unfortunately, in bioethics, we are confronting an extremely narrow framework, um, narrow history, narrow application of um, ethical analyses, and we need to expand it if it's going to be truly ethical, it's going to be truly fair, and if it's going to be actually be true. Right now, I think we're making a lot of determinations uh, in the belief that we're making the best ethical decision, but we're wrong. We're wrong because we simply don't have all the information. And that's something that we can change, we can fix. Next slide, please. 
The racial myopia in bioethics has um, multiple points of origin. I'm going to try to touch on several of them. But it's really important to understand that they all have a common effect. The effect is to shrink our world and put at the center of it the people in our world who have the most power, the most wealth, the most access to health and health resources, and to constrict the concerns of all others. It's the opposite of what bioethics is striving for. And yet that's exactly what the um, machine is generating right now. If we don't make important changes in the way that we view the various um, conditions I'm going to talk about, then we're going to be trapped in this narrow framework. Next slide, please. History, vitally important for bioethics. Bioethics is um, performed and promulgated and publicized and embraced based on narratives that present to us dilemmas, present to us problems posed by medical care posed by medical conditions. But when these stories are constricted, so they're only, we're only hearing the stories of certain people, of white people, of Western people, of wealthy people, then we are ignoring the rest of the world. And in this country, um, our ignorance of history as it affects people of color has crippled our ability to be fair. Um, the history of medicine is carefully curated to elide the experience of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, many marginalized groups. And in doing this, we end up looking at um, events and issues and problems that are of import to the powerful people. Um, race, of course, is part of and parcel of this, but before we talk about race, we really have to embrace and accept and predicate our discussions on the inherent illogic of race. Um, when I studied medieval literature, uh, it's interesting, there were no white people in early Europe. There were no white people in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. Whiteness was invented just as uh, being African-American in this country was an invention. It was an invention of scholars who set out to tell the country who pe people of color were, who African-Americans were. And the picture they painted was one that supported enslavement. They painted a picture of people who couldn't care for themselves, who were unintelligent, who had profoundly different bodies, so different that they actually constituted a different species, of people who had um, bestial sexuality, of people who had low intelligence, of people who had diseases that white people didn't get, and immunities that white people didn't enjoy, of a different species. And this different species was designed to be a slave. It was designed to work long hours under the hot tropical sun. It was designed to be submissive to white people, white men in particular. It was designed to um, engage in activities that increase its chance of becoming ill with malaria or yellow fever because the, um, the, the fiction was promulgated by scientists that black people didn't suffer, didn't die from yellow fever, didn't die as often from malaria. It was an, um, so the image of the African-American was constructed by doctors, was constructed by scientists for a really venal end to support enslavement. That has been our history. And the fact that we don't know that makes it really difficult to recognize um, these tendencies when they occur today. Uh, the history tells us that American School of Technology in the 19th century said African-Americans do not feel pain. You can work them long hours in the fields. You can uh, do research on them that you wouldn't do on white people because they don't feel pain. And so we could laugh at this belief. How absurd. Who would believe a thing like that, especially a scientist? But look at what happens today. In 2016, University of Virginia conducted research showing that 50% of all medical students who responded believed that African Americans did not feel pain the way whites do. So did a good proportion of practicing doctors. Um, doctors in general in this country don't believe that black people have the same bodies as whites. They, uh, the claim is that we need more radiation. We're more prone to diseases like sickle cell. We um, have all kinds of um, diseases that whites don't get. Sickle cell anemia is probably a perfect example because the fiction that it's a black disease in this country is almost universal, despite the fact that we know differently. Sickle cell disease affects people who live in proximity to the Anopheles mosquito because it's, it's partially protective against malaria. 
that's the science, but the mythology tells us something different. All in all, it's really important to understand how our ignorance of history, how the way we've perverted history is keeping us from understanding that we keep repeating the same errors over and over again. And we have ethical um, frameworks that excuse it. I use the, the verb excuse, you know, advisedly, um, that simply don't hold logical water, but we are used to using them and so we persist in using them. Next slide, please. So what we need are more holistic perspectives that take into account the experience of all people, the medical state of all people, the challenges facing all people, not those white people in the West. And a really good example of that, in my opinion, is our dialogue around the perennial argument about whether or not we should use um, US funds and US resources to provide medications to people in the developing world. This is always cast as a discussion about white benef benevolence. Should we be beneficent and give people, poor people in the developing world um, medications for their diseases? It's going to cost a lot of money. Can we afford to do so? That becomes the um, ten tenets of the argument. It's completely ignoring the fact that the medications in question are things that we often have obtained from the people developing world. We're actually in our debt in that way. They were tested more cheaply and more quickly in the developing world, making the medications available to us more cheaply and more quickly than they normally would have been. And yet we ignore that fact in our determinations. From my perspective, that means that we are in the debt of the people in the developing world, and we shouldn't be using the language of um, beneficence and giving them medications, but rather we would it would be partial repayment for what they have done for us. That's the kind of perspective that we need to adopt more broadly. We need to take in uh, the perspectives of everyone. Next slide, please. In the developing world, but also sometimes in this country, um, one of the many semantic concerns I have, and semantics, of course, are very important for philosophical determinations and analyses, right? One of my concerns is our use of futility. Um, all too often, we're faced with an ethical or a moral dilemma in which we admit that yes, the right thing to do would be to take an act. The right thing to do would be to give free medications or cheap medications to people in the developing world. The right thing to do, yes, would be to make the expensive surgeries that people who are poor cannot afford, that people who are um, African-Americans are less likely to be able to afford, to you know, make them more affordable by um, funding them ourselves. But very often, instead of an ethical defense for our, for our failure to do so, we offer futility. We would love to be able to do this. We simply can't. We can't pay for medications for the whole world. We can't pay for surgeries for everyone in the country. We can't afford to expand Medicaid to the, the millions of people in this country who desperately need it to stay alive. So futility is often invoked, but futility is often um, less a fact than a construct. And I found it really interesting that Jeremy Bentham, revered as the father of utilitarianism, proposed utilitarianism when he was a young man. When he was an older man, he wrote something different. He, he actually wrote an indictment of futility and invoking it so frequently. The plea of impossibility offers itself at every step in justification of injustice in all its forms. He went on to say that first we create the impossibility, then we invoke it. That should be invoke, not evoke, sorry. So basically, futility is something that is sometimes manufactured in order to avoid taking the right step. Um, that's my stance. That's something I think we that happens frequently, but we fail to see it because we don't employ the ethical language and the ethical constructs that would allow us to understand and equally weigh the effects of decisions on all people. Next slide, please. We also have the um, not really novel question of data and the abuses of data. It looks like a new question, and I think it's um, burgeoning is indeed new. It's much more common and much more um, immediate and 
and um, compelling than before because we deal so heavily with data, data that often have been processed in ways that are not really transparent to the people analyzing it. But it's always been the case that technology has been put in service of marginalizing ethnic groups. It was a very common strategy for separating people of color from the medical attention they need, from separating people of color from being perceived as worthy of the medication they need. Everything from color wheels meant to predict skin color to other technologies that were invoked to try to determine African-Americans um, prone to certain ailments or the likelihood that certain cures would be effective on them. Now we're seeing vast amounts of data that have sometimes have been collected in a racialized way. For example, DNA sweeps are intentionally racial. They intentionally look for DNA samples from people of color, typically African-American men. They look at their samples, they match their samples with the samples from a crime scene, trying to find uh, the guilty person. They've been used very heavily in this country. Uh, 7,000 cases that I analyzed, the number of guilty persons that were found, one. Yet these data go into a, collect, into a database, all of Black and Hispanic men, to be consulted when they're next looking for a criminal. Now we have these databases in CODIS, federal databases and state databases, and they are collective presumption of guilt. You're looking for criminals and you're only gonna look at the genetic data from African-American men. But the reality is most people, most men in this country, and therefore most criminals in this country are white. By excluding them, you're removing them from consideration. That's only one of the many, many examples of how these vast amounts of data are um, racially manipulated in ways that we simply don't see in their final state and often are not acknowledged. Their analysis is also often manipulated. Um, the classic example is the many cases I've seen where indication of a biological factor or propensity has been found in data. As you read the literature, suddenly the biological um, factor turns into a genetic factor not always with any intervening support for this, um, the sea change. So we have, it's very, um, it's very insidious because the data look very objective. Rows and rows of numbers look, what could be more objective than that? But in reality, they're shrouding the same racism that has nakedly been um, contributing to the abuse of African-Americans through our history. It's something that demands a lot of attention. It's finally getting some attention, but it should be attention that's more widespread. And certainly it's something that bioethicists need to engage in. Next slide, please. I mentioned semantics earlier, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail, but I wrote this article in the American the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, where I talk about how semantics is um, having a profound, what profoundly affects medical, um, medical journalism and medical care. It also profoundly affects medical ethics because you, the language that is used very often um, codifies, um, a sort of scientific dog whistle, if you will, codifies certain um, beliefs and mythologies that have not been demonstrated, but have long contributed to the abuse of African-Americans. When you talk about research and you focus only upon African-American behavior, that implies that African-American pathological behavior is a problem and not a problem in the healthcare system. When you use language like paranoia or past abuses, you're implying the abuses are confined to the past, which means someone complaining about a contemporary abuse is automatically being dismissed. Even the umbrella term conspiracy theories. I wrote a piece for the New York Times, which I pointed out that conspiracy theories are sometimes applied, uh, labels applied to beliefs promulgated by the poor and marginalized and uh, undereducated. And it's a way of dismissing their beliefs without ever investigating them. In the past, beliefs held by African-Americans that were labeled as conspiracy theories have later turned out to be true. The Tuskegee syphilis study, for example, that overburdened icon of American medicine, that study was originally promulgated by the Black Panthers who cried it, only be dismissed as conspiracy theorists. But when you had scholars, excellent scholars like Ellen Brandt 
and Jay Katz from Yale, Ellen Branch from Columbia, when they indicted the study, people respected their opinions. And so they, uh, they uh, accepted their evaluation of the study as being profoundly unethical. And while I mentioned Tuskegee, I have to say that part of the mythology of American history is that Tuskegee study is often trotted out. In fact, it's always trotted out whenever there's a widespread abuse against African Americans. This is a huge mistake on several levels. First of all, it's very often a poor parallel. Second of all, it's not the worst study to affect African Americans by far. In reading my book, you will see that there were hundreds and hundreds of studies. Tuskegee was only one. But invoking it gives the impression that African Americans are overreacting to a single study rather than overreacting to four centuries of abuse in the healthcare arena. So we need to abandon this knee-jerk reaction to compare everything to Tuskegee and try to explain African American behavior in terms of Tuskegee. The behavior is regrettable and even tragic, but avoiding the healthcare system from fear of doctors and fear of medicine is actually a logical reaction to centuries of abuse. Next slide, please. And our contemporary issue that um, my current obsession, something I think is very much a concern of bioethics I want to see more attention to, is I think that insidiously, um, it's quite clear that medical consent is slowly being taken off the table. It's being removed from um, the menu of options when it comes to many subjects and patients are no longer being availed informed consent. In the past, this would happen after the, 19, after the 1940s in Nuremberg. In the past, it happened by uh, scientists and doctors who actually broke the law. But now it's legal. In many cases, the law sanctions um, conducting research without asking a person's permission. This is a grave ethical error. J. Capps call, uh, called it a fatal a fatal step, and I'm inclined to agree with him. I think we need to re uh, closely examine um, the erosion of medical consent and the fact that it's happening very frequently among African Americans and the easiest case to find did transpire among African Americans doesn't mean it's not a uh, problem for white Americans as well because I did not uncover every instance of it. It's a problem for all of us. And if anything, even if it is primarily African Americans right now, we are the canaries in the coal mine. And abrogation of our right to consent is going to mean the abrogation of your right to consent tomorrow. Next slide, please. Um, I won't go into detail now in the interest of um, time, but we can talk about this in the Q&A. In my book, Deadly Monopolies, I point out how the third world, the developing world, the global south, is being used as a laboratory of the West. Um, not only are subjects and patients being made to um, undergo um, experimentation and abuses to benefit um, patients and subjects in the West, but also there's the appropriation of intellectual property from the developing world. In India, for example, neem, which has been used for centuries in a variety of um, medical and spiritual applications, it was actually taken from the country and patented here in the US. And now you have the case of US um, researchers and innovators patenting foreign intellectual property. And now the people in the developing world have to pay US companies to use their own intellectual property, to use medications and herbs and you know modalities that they have been using for centuries and that they have refined. So, um, it's one of many, many serious problems around the commodification of medicine, and it does affect um, people of color more than whites. Next slide, please. Of course, there are solutions. Problems have solutions. And a few of them I'm going to mention now are we need to institute written criteria for parity. We talk about them. It's wonderful development that we're now beginning to we're getting, talk about these things, bring them into open. But without written criteria, it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to hold people to account. I think that we also need to focus on the foreseeable effects of ethical decisions, not on the intention. I'm less concerned with labeling something racist or non-racist than I am concerned with the predictable, foreseeable effects of a um, tendency. When I wrote my book about environmental racism, 
a terrible thing to waste, I was appalled to find how often the courts would find that African Americans were indeed being harmed by companies and institutions that were polluting the areas, yet were not going to suffer consequences because what had not been proved was the intention to poison African Americans. Why was the intention important? Why is that a predicate for, um, you know, healing the situation and imposing justice. Um, and there's more to say, but there's no time. So I'm going to stop here and uh, thank you for the chance to share this with you. It's disturbing and thought provoking. And uh, as you say, uh, with, with some hope for change. Uh, so I'm going to jump to some questions. We've gotten some great questions in the audience. And please, people who are watching, uh, please feel free to add additional questions. And we hope uh, to be able to get to them. Uh, one question here is um, from Noni Unobaga. How do you best propose we address vaccine hesitancy in minority mm -hmm. communities while acknowledging that medical racism of the past and present contribute to such fears? I'd love I'd to like address that. Okay. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that it's a problematic phrase there of the past. It's not confined to the past. It was only last year that two French doctors proposed that ethically troubled research be conducted in Africa, citing the case of prostitutes that have been used in prior studies. Um, the CIA actually was engaged in a fake vaccination campaign that led to people shunning polio vaccination killing seven vaccinators and the polio rates in several countries skyrocketing. So we have had recent um, actions by unfortunately healthcare workers that have actually abused people using vaccines. And this, unfortunately we, as we promulgate this myth that vaccines have absolutely no problems, I think it's counterproductive. I know we're doing it in order to instill confidence but it's having the opposite effect. Because when we say that, people find out otherwise, that's going to erode trust. I think it's a better idea to admit these missteps, point out A, they're very rare, thankfully, and B, point out that they do not reflect the behavior of most healthcare workers, and then hope that people will have increased trust. Great, thank you. Other panelists wanna take a stab at that? Uh, yeah, I will. Um, so I've, I've had this experience where I've encountered people like at the hair salon and says, Oh, I'm, I'm not getting the vaccine, right? You know what they do to us. Or I had, uh, I did an interview with Vox about why I think people should get vaccinated. And, you know, the stream of, of angry phone calls after my work, uh, my work uh, email, I mean, on my work phone. And I think what, what you have to sort of stress to people who are fearful is like Harriet said, is acknowledging that these fears are real, but it's, it's about not making them feel dumb, not making them feel like um, there's like, like they are believing in a conspiracy that's not real. Right. So, but it's about having the conversations and taking the time to talk to them and understanding why they feel this way, making sure that they have correct information, making sure they're not reading, you know, fake websites that uh, want to dispel, uh, want to um, give out false information, but making sure that they have access to things that they can educate themselves, but listening and understanding. And I think too, accepting that there will be some people who don't get vaccinated. Um, I think that's something that is unfortunate, but it's something that we have to accept as long as we do our part to talk, educate and discuss and listen. And I think that's really important is to really, really listen. Um, but. I, I think that there would just be some people who don't get vaccinated and uh, we have to not blame them, not call them dumb, not call them stupid. Great, great points. Uh, here's another question from Alexis Walker. Pushing for strong positions on racism and justice, for instance, about police budgets as an issue impacting race and health, as a scholar is often dismissed as political and therefore not objective as if knowledge is not always political and situated. How can we best confront this tendency? I would point out the fact that the police behavior is often closely allied to medical problems. If you look at Elijah McLean, he died because of a ketamine experiment that's being conducted in his city in Colorado. It's also being conducted in Minnesota. Ketamine is being forced on people as part of experimental protocol. And um, many, 
people have complained that when EMTs call the police, the police pressure them to give the um, subject ketamine. And that's what happened in this case, and he died. Um, also, there's a recent New York Times article, um, very unfortunate, blaming deaths uh, in police custody on sickle cell trait. I was staggered by that article of blame the victim narrative if I ever saw one, but it sought to excuse police behavior by positing a supposed biological uh, flaw in African-Americans. So they are connected. Other panelists want to try respond to that? Okay. Uh, so here's another question. Um, uh, uh, like any academic discipline, it's from Eric Suba, bioethics eschews activism. However, to adequately address race, activism is necessary. Where are spaces where bioethics and activism for racial justice can meet? Joanne, do you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, it's a wonderful question, and I just, I, I work in the community. So to me, my work is not divorced from activism. I am a community activist at heart. Um, it is what drives my work. And I believe that bioethics and bioethics as a field needs to recognize that one, we were founded on activism. Um, and two, in order to really restore and repair the injustices that have been done against communities of color, you really have to uplift that none of it would have been done without activism. And that's why we are pushing forward with leading with justice and leading with action because everything great that has come out of bioethics came the same way. Um, I don't know why bioethics is thinking it's a new narrative. It's always been there. We just need to push harder. All right. And I should say, by the way, when I read Noni's question, uh, she actually said past and present uh, on uh, the, uh, I might just the, um, the way I read it may not have made the present part. Yeah, I only heard, I only heard past. I'm glad she said that. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, sorry if I uh, stumbled a little bit in, it in happens. saying that. <laughs> Uh, so uh, another question from Noni, uh, in the backdrop of the COVID pandemic, what would you say are the big, the greatest lessons learned regarding medical racism? Uh, Louis, do you want to take that? Yes, I can try. Uh, the, the major issue is that <clears throat> people are focusing currently on the COVID-19 pandemic, but these problems have existed for centuries in America. The only thing that COVID-19 did is everything that was hidden uh, became exposed to the view of everyone to see. That's the only difference. Uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, mortality among pregnant women who are black and Hispanic was higher than their white counterpart. Even if you adjust for social, uh, socioeconomic factors and education, those disparities persist. I work at a cancer hospital. And when you look at cancer, there has been significant decline in cancer-related morbidity and mortality over the past three decades. But yet, the disparity that exists between African-American and white persists even through these gains. And that's the reason I don't think that COVID-19 loves African-American and Hispanic more than white folks. Uh, uh, white citizens of America, or of any other country for that matter. The reality is simple. If you are poor, you are confined to certain jobs where you cannot earn a paycheck without having people interfacing with you who may be carrying the virus. If you live in certain housing conditions, if you are poorly educated, your risk of having COVID-19 is significantly higher 
And also your risk of being hospitalized is higher because you do not have the means to seek medical care immediately because you are preoccupied by putting food on the, food on the table or paying rent for your family. And also your many of them, many of these individuals are underinsured. They do not have, when we talk about universal healthcare insurance in America, it's an illusion because healthcare in America is intimately late, link, I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, to having a job. So if I have to work three part-time jobs, which is the case for many people prior to the pandemic, I will not have a good health insurance. Therefore, and also I have to decide if I'm sick, am I going to seek medical care or am I going to go to work and ignore my symptoms? And then finally, we also have a variety of other factors that influence the rate of obesity and hypertension. That's the reason I think we need to continue talking about social determinant of health. Because if I'm living in certain neighborhood where I am exposed to toxic, and, to toxic substances, if I live in an environment where every day there is a shooting, if I live in an environment where not only I'm afraid of gangs, but I'm also afraid of police officers who are supposed to protect me, I will eventually develop PTSD and chronic hypertension and so forth. And as a result of all of this, which is a legacy of redlining and a variety of policies that are embedded into the American society. So that's the reason these inequities are not superficial. They are, extra, they are structural. And that's what ultimately when COVID-19 happened, the scale of the pandemic and the rapidity of the spread of the virus created conditions where African-American, Hispanic, and uh, Indian living in reservation and other portion of the country became the, the group who were uh, uh, affected the most, but there are no genetic or biological factors that predispose these individuals to having COVID-19 more. Even when you factor obesity and hypertension, it may affect their mortality because of other quote, the impact of the COVID-19 on the lungs causing multi-organ failure. But the reality to catch the virus to begin with, it is because of the way these people live. And until we address these issues systematically, we are going to have problems in this country. Very well. And I think that's, that's where the voices of bioethicists is important. We need to continue resonate the idea that inequity, inequities in a society create for currently, we are living a historic moment where our social cohesion is threatened. And I am fearful for the future of this country. Thank you. Well said. Uh, here's a question from Hasita uh, Karthikian. When we talk about prejudice concerning people of a different race other than white, how are we categorizing those people? Is it different from Asia, for Asians than it is for Latin Americans? So we think about race and we often think about uh, African-Americans and Latinos. Uh, uh, what about Asians or other uh, We need to, I can, I can tackle that. There was an excellent article, in fact, on CNN. I forgot the name of the author, but you can, you can Google it. Uh, the Asian community in America, for that matter, is not a monolithic block. Uh, we tend to look, even the African-American community in America, I am from Haitian ancestry. Uh, I have a bunch of colleagues who are from Africa. And then you have uh, uh, native African-Americans from multi-generations who are coexisting in this country. We have commonalities, but we also have nuances and difference. And in the Asian communities, the same. Uh, Indian are different than Pakistani, and they are. If you are from Southeast Asia, your you, your view and your political alliance 
in your aspiration, in your perspective of the world, as well as your socioeconomic status, by the way, and your education, your level of education, all of that is different depending on your 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 singular ethnic group among Asian as a big group. So we need to recognize that and understand that when we're talking about it, there are Asian that will be affected to the same level as African-American or Hispanic. And there are other Asian uh, communities who would be less affected by a variety of healthcare related issues. Other panelists want to respond? Yeah, yeah. I, I do want to say that um, I want to add that it's important to, in these discussions, to limit our analyses of what happens to an ethnic group to what has actually been demonstrated. I mean, a lot of things seem logical, but we don't, they don't always play out the way we think they're going to. The other thing is that it's not only belonging to the ethnic group, it's also the way you're treated by the healthcare system. So African-Americans from divergent groups may share commonalities because what's the precipitating factor is not their own um, health status or history or a culture, but rather the fact that they are being perceived as African-American by the healthcare system, you know? So um, that's, I think it's an important factor to keep in mind. And um, I think it's also important not to try to extrapolate too much from one group what's going to happen to the other one. Joanne, did you want to say something there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a great question. I, I'm not sure who who raised it. But the same thing goes for Latinos. Um, we are very diverse. We are not in a vacuum. There are many traditions, many languages, um, many cultural practices that inform us as a tapestry. But as um, Harriet said, you cannot prescribe what happens to one group to the other group because there's completely different abuses. There's completely different interactions with the healthcare system. We, in our culture um, and cultures do have racism within the Latino community that we have to deal with ourselves. There's a lot of anti-Blackness, um, a lot of colorism. So until you understand those layers um, and you're able to really sit with the complexities that come with being an indigenous Latino or a Black Latino or a white Latino, you won't really understand the way that you interact with care or you don't really understand the way that access is made available to certain groups based on their skin color or the way that they speak or their traditions and is excluded for other groups. So I am so glad that somebody asked that question because um, that deserves a, a whole paper. <laughs> yeah, can I chime in? I, I think it's also really important to remember that um, healthcare is not independent of what happens in our general society. Healthcare is, does not occur in a vacuum, right? So healthcare is not um, all of a sudden you get in healthcare and now all of the ills of society go away and everyone is treated equally. Healthcare reflects the values and the devaluing that we do in our everyday society. So a lot of the ills that are unique to different groups, the way that uh, black people may be discriminated against is going to be different than the way that Asian people are discriminated against. And that then translates over into healthcare. So the ways that they are discriminated against in healthcare are going to be different. The health inequities and the social determinants of those health inequities are going to be different. But we can't look at healthcare and what happens there as this separate vacuum from the rest of the world. But we have to remember that it is going to be different per group and then individuals within those group, as everyone else has already said. But we have to just remember that healthcare is a reflection of who we value, who we devalue, and the ways that we do that in our general society. Great. Well said. And again, I just want to remind our audience, we have a few more minutes. So uh, please, if you have other questions, now is your chance to, to raise them. Uh, here's a question from Ann Zimmerman. How can a framework reconfigure the white saviorism to allow the global South to develop and manufacture and profit from medications, vaccines, et cetera, bioethics often teaches humanitarian aid approaches. So I assume is that a better approach or what do people think? 
I think there's a conflict here between the bioethic um, idealism and the harsh realities of capitalism, because very often research in the global south is being funded directly or indirectly by corporations who expect a return on their money. And it's cheaper to cut corners. It's cheaper not to get informed consent. It's cheaper not to adhere to high standards. And you add to that the fact that we're operating on a dual sta uh, legal standard. The Declaration of Helsinki has been modified fairly recently to reduce protections. Uh, for example, um, in the US, in most of the US, in most of the West, you have to offer people in an arm of the experiment um, an approved medication as an option, uh, the standard of care in one's country. But under Declaration of Helsinki now, since it's been changed, you only have to offer them the standard of care in their country, which often is nothing. So um, there are several layers here to be addressed. Um, we have to not only get bioethics on board, I think that's gonna be the easiest group, we have to deal with this, um, the corporate framework and find some way of having bioethics um, modify or soften the pursuit of the profit motive. Other panelists wanna to respond to that? Yeah, um, I, yeah I'll say, there. I'll, just real quick, I'll, there, I think there are many ways to go about this, but I think one is, acknowledging our role and why these countries are the way that they are, the way why they can't take care of their people, why they don't have enough vaccines, why they don't have enough nurses and physicians and therapists and all that. And one big thing that we haven't acknowledged from the wealthier country is the reparations. We owe these countries what we've taken away from them. And then if we did that, maybe they would have the resources to care for themselves. We wouldn't have to be talking about white saviorism. Okay. And I am I do want to add that when when you look at white saberism, like, um, for example, in Latin American countries um, and in the region, your our our governments are often operating from white frameworks. So what they so what they have been taught um, and this is a colonial mindset uh, to aspire to the way that white folks do things. So until we start to a allow our people to educate our people um, and to show them what are some of the right ways to do things based on the resources that we have, we're never going to get out of this cycle because our countries and our leaders and our systems are aspiring to the to what whiteness is and what whiteness teaches as perfection which is then trickles down to our society i agree with, with both these comments but i also want to add very quickly that let's not forget that in addition to the um disintegration of healthcare systems in these countries there's often the fact some of these countries have gotten tax systems where they have medical personnel who have agenda that run contrary to white saviorism and they're not listened to Tanzanian scientists, for example, have a very good framework for protecting their intellectual property. But when they go to court, they often are they are fighting the U.S. government and Merck, who are trying to, you know, make a case for not observing Tanzanian law. Uh, so I think we have to remember that sometimes they're intact, and we're only. I think we tend to hear and read about the ones that are not. So uh, here's a question from uh, Michelle Zimmerman. Uh, she writes, given the history of medical racism leading to genetic changes in marginalized races, how do we move forward while still focusing on the health of the patient? So I, I think sort of, you know, there's genetics and then there's health and what should we do with genetics and genetic information? I'm afraid I don't understand the question. What a connection between genetics and yeah, it's a little unclear. I, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you want to clarify that leading to genetic changes. I think uh, you may have meant a different word there. I, th I think one, the way I'm looking at this question or one question I'll rephrase it as is uh, uh, given how fraught genetics is and racism has been in involved with genetics research in the past, how should we best use genetics given diversity in a population? to avoid some of the pitfalls that might occur? Logically, more logically than we've done so far. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mythology around genetics. And um, James Watson continues to insist that we're going to find the gene for intelligence. He said, we'll find it in 10 years. That was 15 years ago. 
he makes a perennial claim. He's not the only one, you know, he's just the most famous one. And um, genetics um, research into the mean gene, postulating that uh, the genetic um, origin for violent behavior focuses on African-American men. And we, the government has poured a huge amount of money into it, especially in the 70s. It's still a very, it's a prime focus and with no results. There are no results because there's nothing there. But, you know, unfortunately, um, I think we need to have a more logical and nuanced look at genetics. Um, genetics, it's, it's a case of a technology being a great servant and a horrific master. <laughs> you know, if, you were, if we were to, um, use it logically, it might be useful, but as long as we're allowing it to be dictated by mythology, we're only gonna find um, more racism. Great comment. Yeah, Bob, I think maybe this question, when I read it, I thought maybe it was talking about weathering and how weathering maybe it can, uh, you know, can sort of change, uh, you know, shorten, you know, shorten our, our lifespans. Maybe that's where this question is coming from. And to think about how the social nature of weathering can change, you know, biological aspects of those experiencing it, particularly uh, people of color. And I think this is one way that if we focus on the social, then health inequities would 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 decrease, sort of um, like what Louis was speaking about. So maybe that's where this question is coming from. Great comments as well. So unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, first, I want to thank all our panelists. Clearly, there's a lot of issues here, and uh, I think it's a, a fantastic conversation with lots of provocative and important insights. Uh, so uh, thank you all. This was great. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you all uh, to all our attendees. It was uh, great to have you uh, join us and ask questions. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, if you're interested in some of our other uh, events that we've had. We have uh, our website, uh, Columbia Bioethics, has uh, all of our past events, videos of them there available, and we have upcoming events as well. Uh, so uh, again, please feel free to join us for our future events, take, check out our past ones, and uh, thank you all again to the panelists and also to our uh, uh, crew at Columbia who made this possible, and have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.